Here we go. Live? It says it's live. Is it? Are we? Not sure. I mean, it says nine. <laughs> I'm getting a red arrow <laughs> for Facebook. That might have been something on Facebook. Well, we're live now, so we're going for it. Okay. So, some people are watching, so we we must have some people. So, hi guys, welcome back to another Monday night webinar. This is how I like remind myself what day of the week it is. Um, <laughs> We have Nathan Peterson here tonight, one yeah. of my favorite people. We just tucked in both of our toddlers, so we're ready to go. Um, I love Nathan, um, been following him for a long time. We've done lots of lives together. We've done some YouTubes together um, on his channel, and now he's coming on to hang out with all of us tonight. So mm -hmm. um, Nathan, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and make sure you, um, we'll tell them a couple of times, but I definitely want them to know about your course. I tell people about yeah. it all the time. So make sure you drop your course and where they can find more about you. For sure. Yeah, I'm Nathan Peterson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and I have a private practice in Texas and I created a, an online step-by-step -step course, kind of taking you through what OCD looks like, how to do exposures and how to maintain progress. Um, and I recently created one for BFRBs, which is like hair pulling and skin picking and um, all these other things. Uh, the reason I created it is because you know, as, as Jenna knows, it's hard to sometimes find a, a good specialist in the area and people reach out to me all over the all over the country and i'm like hey well i have this course that maybe maybe can help you um definitely doesn't replace therapy but it's it's, it's really good um whether you're seeing a therapist or you're kind of just learning on your own what you need to do and yeah. so and those both located at a uh, uh, ocd and anxiety online.com or uh, bfrb online is kind of the new one and so mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. yeah. And the course is so extensive. I mean, even just to scroll through, you give like a nice little preview on your website of kind of what you cover, what to expect. And I think it's so it's so comprehensive. I mean, it's mm -hmm. like you said, it doesn't necessarily replace therapy, but so many people can't access a therapist. So many people, you know, don't have the funds there. They just don't have access to a therapist depending on where they are or they're in between sessions or they just need something to hold them accountable maybe after therapy. So such a great, great resource. Yeah. Um, your YouTube channel too. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. exactly. And so, uh, yeah, YouTube channel, I just hit 30,000 subscribers on there and that's, you know, the channel name's OCD and anxiety. So pretty unique name. And, uh, yeah, I do videos every single week on, you know, OCD and anxiety and ticks and BFRBs and just things that I wish that, you know, I knew as I was learning all of this stuff and um, mainly started creating those videos just to send out to people like, hey, this is what I think that you have, or this is what, you know, something that might sound familiar to what you're going through. Um, and really mainly it was for just kind of my own clients and realize that more people started watching it and realize that, yeah, it's, it's been pretty helpful and I, I love the feedback people give me on those i want to keep doing it yeah that's other fun they're fun um which brings us to tonight right so mm -hmm. we will try to answer some of your questions um i try to answer or get to questions that would be broad enough to you know capture a lot of people's experiences so um hopefully that's what you guys will get out of us tonight i mm -hmm. And I don't go in order. So just if your like question came after and you're upset that I missed your question, I may come back to it. So, but I do love this question. Um, I think we can go, especially the second part of it. Like, I don't know if I've ever been asked that question that way before. Like, what is the biggest mistake people do when trying to cure OCD? Um, and I think that word in and of itself is probably a fault, like one of, would be one of my answers. Like I think one of the biggest mistakes you can have at the onset of approaching treatment is that it is to be cured or that you have, that you should have the strategy of get rid of. Um, I think that's maybe one of the biggest mistakes that people can make when they start the, their pursuit of therapy, that they want to have the strategy of get rid of. I need to get rid of anxiety. I need to get rid of my intrusive thoughts. I need to get rid of, get rid of, get rid of. And if you go into therapy with that mindset, with that strategy of get rid of, we're, we're screwed from the get-go, right? So I know it's hard to swallow sometimes, but really instead trying to have the mentality, trying to have the um, 
strategy of accepting, trying to have the strategy of I'm going to learn how to try to accept these thoughts. I'm going to try to learn how to have a different relationship with them and ultimately, you know, better handle my responses to them. So that would be, to me, one of the biggest mistakes that people can make when they try to approach their recovery, um, that they try to have the strategy of get rid of versus accept. Um, Nathan, what do you think? That's like almost exactly what I was going to say is when people are looking for that cure, uh, and they'll hear an answer maybe from a specialist of like, hey, let's do some exposure and response prevention, which can sound like a really, really, really scary treatment. And they're like, well, that's not, I mean, people say that that's not really a cure. So I'm going to move on to maybe like a homeopathic way, or I'm going to try this thing over here. Or this person said that they were able to cure somebody in six weeks or whatever it is. People, I mean, we want that answer. And that's one of the at least biggest mistakes is trying not to find that cure, but more look for, you know, what can you do to manage these, these symptoms that are coming up and kind of think about it in that way. So how can I manage these symptoms and do hopefully the treatment that is kind of prescribed for OCD and anxiety, which is, I mean, that exposure and response prevention, which is like that gold standard treatment that we want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's learning to accept that this is what people say the treatment is. I don't really understand it maybe 100%, but that's okay. I'm willing to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, it's such yeah, a hard, had, hard way our, to live. We had on. our therapist, Karen Gill. Um, I didn't watch all of it, but she went over on our um, Treat My OCD Instagram page. She went over the difference between willingness versus white knuckling. And even just the first couple minutes of it, I think is relevant to what it is that you're saying. Like we have to be willing to accept <laughs> um, kind of first and foremost versus like this white knuckling, like I'm just gonna do whatever my therapist tells me to do and I'm just gonna do it and still hope that I get rid of it <laughs> because it's mm. just, it's not gonna work that way. Right. Well, and first part, you know, why are OCD thoughts? Why do they feel so real, you know? Medically, I'm not sure exactly what, what goes on in the brain to make that feel so real, but I know that it usually starts with that first kind of response that the person had because of the trigger where the brain said, oh, look, you got yourself out of that anxiety. So good job. Do it again, which is that compulsion. Mm -hmm. And it continues to feel more real and more real because most of the time because of those compulsions that say like, this is you did a good job to get this to go away. So do it again. Um, I'm going to really remind you that you are in danger, even if you're not, because you did those compulsions to get out of it. So, you know, and it keeps that cycle going. Um, so they feel real because we respond as if they're real. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's at least what my take from it. Yeah. You guys can probably hear my toddler freaking out in the background. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised I might, mine haven't like knocked on the door yet. But. I might escape downstairs, but we'll do it mid question. Maybe I'll I'll answer the next one and then I might have a change of scenery. Um, <laughs> I like this one because I don't know. I always say I know a lot about one thing, um, but I don't know as much about the other ones. Um, so what is your opinion on experimental therapy, including ketamine, psilocybin, and electric stimulation? So my, without knowing the research off the top of my head, what I tell people is you could have the best medication, you could have the best supplements, you could have the best this, that, and the other thing. If you, at the end of the day, still don't have really good quality exposure and response prevention, whether that's with a good therapist or with an awesome course like what Nathan offers, then it's it's you're not going to be getting very far. Um, so no other um, intervention even holds a candle close to exposure and response prevention when it comes to the treatment of OCD and anxiety. And so I think a lot of times people want whatever else they can get, right? They want this other thing or this other treatment because they're so desperate for something to work and understandably so. OCD is debilitating and it's awful and exposure and response prevention treatment feels, it just sounds bad. It just sounds so scary and the initial buy-in can be hard sometimes. Um, but you know, there's, there is no other way through out than through. Um, and so you can have all the other odds kind of stacked in your favor. And that's great. Like as far as medication goes, like that's effective. Um, but you need good, solid exposure and response prevention. So Nathan, why don't you give your thoughts? I'm mm -hmm. going to escape downstairs. <laughs> all right. 
<laughs> Sounds good. So if I'm still here, awesome. Well, my my thoughts on this specifically is when people are looking for these experimental therapies, um, it's not always the case, but it seems like they're looking for this because they don't want to do exposure and response prevention, or maybe they've done it and it feels like it really hasn't worked. Um, because we'll look for research online of like, oh, does this work? Oh, does this work? Oh, does this work? And this, from what I've seen, ketamine, you know, I can't say because I'm not a medical doctor, but I've seen some good results uh, from something like this. Uh, but it doesn't replace therapy for sure. These other things that, you know, electrical stimulation, um, you know, what is that machine? Oh, man, I totally forgot the name of it. The TMS. TMS. Yeah, TMS machine. You know, they're definitely doing more research on that. And, you know, IOCDF had an article about that recently. And, uh, yeah, there's – but one, one sentence I saw in there was, like, this is not first-line treatment. This is something that people have done exposure and response prevention and maybe with an individual therapist. And if that hasn't worked, they go to uh, a treatment center where it's more intense, so four to six hours a day. And if that hasn't worked, maybe this is something you try. Mm -hmm. and so it wasn't like everybody go run and do this because it, you know, it's going to help you. Um, and that's kind of my thoughts on it is uh, do, the, do what we know works first. Mm -hmm. And then maybe these other things, people experiment if they do or not, but it's not the, this is going to get me through if I take that ketamine mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. Change of environment. We made it. <laughs> Thank you guys for hanging with me. Thanks, Nathan, for yeah. on the show. <laughs> it's way quieter <laughs> down here. <laughs> All right. Yes. All those things will me. Oh, you have some. Uh, oh my gosh! Hey, you have some fans. You have some fans <laughs> in the comment section. Can you see them? Um, I need to go through the questions. I haven't been looking down them. Look at that! <laughs> I love him so happy. You're so nice. Seriously, <laughs> thank you so much. That is so sweet. Oh, Laura, someone just purchased the online course. There you oh, go. That's so nice. Thank That's you so, so much. Awesome. Honestly, I always appreciate that support. Like, it's such a good course. I was nerding out just looking at the um, the little like previews. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. All right. I got really excited about the people <laughs> saying hi. Um, hmm. Thanks for answering my question. Makes a lot of sense as a backup instead. Yes. So using it as a kind of a backup is a is a good thing to keep in mind. Um, this is a good question. How late can postpartum OCD pop up? I started struggling a lot last year with intrusive thoughts right before my son turned three. Now I'm seven months pregnant and healing, but wanting to learn more. So there's no like you're never in the clear. Right. Like 100 percent. You will never not get it. Right. Or never get it. So. Um, I think everyone's experience is totally unique. And, you know, you're mentioning, Charlie, that you're pregnant. So much can happen when you're pregnant. A hormonal changes, um, which can definitely affect your mood, affect everything that's going on up there, can definitely be a time of high responsibility, high vulnerability, um, you know, especially with the toddler stage. Hello, like my toddler just freaking out. Um, any new change in life can kind of turn that switch on. So, um, you know, there was always going to be this predisposition, this kind of underlying um, genetic predisposition, but certain life situations or a situation can turn that switch on. And so whether that's, um, you know, right before your son turned three, maybe it was something with just the challenging nature of those behaviors, um, you know, being seven months pregnant, that can definitely affect things too. Um, so yeah, so the answer to your question just really simply is it can come up anytime it can come up intrusive thoughts can happen anytime. Um, so I know in the medical field, especially as it relates to postpartum, you know, I don't necessarily agree with it, but they're pretty much, you know, there are certain time frames on, or like these expectations, you know, if, you know, if it's after three months or after the first year, it's not postpartum. Mm -hmm. 
call it whatever, you know, call it whatever. It's still going to be responsive to the same treatment. If it's OCD, we're going to want to apply exposure and response prevention to it. And you'd benefit from applying those concepts to it. So, but it's awful. I mean, OCD is going to latch on to whatever it is that you value the most. And as a mom, like what, uh, what else is going to come up, right? Like it's, it's, it's very common for it to kind of latch on to your, to your kiddos. So I'm sorry that you're struggling with it, but I'm glad that you're wanting to learn more. That's that psychoeducation piece is definitely um, one of the best ways to kind of arm yourself and equip yourself to get well. Um, Nathan, what do you think? Yeah, I love what you said. Uh, I've I've thought about this before as I've seen individuals who kind of have that postpartum OCD where it's almost like a, that trigger. It's almost like the light switch turned on, whether they were pregnant or they're uh, right after pregnancy and you know time frame wise it, it's hard to know really like I think OCD is OCD and so whether it's you know the postpartum OCD kind of triggered you know everything else um, I've, I've seen people who are, who have toddlers I mean that's years later where you know for me we can say hey this is postpartum OCD because it kind of started during this time and um but i like what jenna said a predisposition towards it so it wasn't getting pregnant you know made me have ocd it was kind of you know we know genetics plays a part we know environmental factors play a part in why somebody might have ocd and uh that's you know definitely pregnancy is just one of those big big moments in somebody's life because we care about like our kids like i've got three kids and i love them to death and I would do anything for them. And so of course, you know, OCD and anxiety wants to attack what we value and what we care about. And that's definitely a huge new value in somebody's life. And, and so we want to make sure we're doing everything we can. So our brain, our people's brains will start doubting what, what their intentions and have intrusive thoughts. And that's just kind of what happens. Which is so unfortunate. Um, Cause we want to, I'm sure you want to enjoy that moment of you know, being pregnant and having a child and enjoying that. Um, and I always say, do treatment, you know, the first sign of, you know, any OCD symptoms um, and not wait for it to see if it's going to go away or not after I have the baby or whatever it is. It's kind of just get started. So you even know what to do. Yeah, if you that's, already. that's such great advice. I work with so many moms who are pregnant and they, you know, say, oh, well, I'll just wait until the baby gets here because once the baby's here, then I won't have anything to worry about. And Charlie, that's not, I don't think that that's what you're saying necessarily, but it's like, oh my gosh, no, once the baby's here, you're only going to have like a million more things potentially to worry about. Right. And when they're a toddler, I won't have anything to worry about. Well, yeah, there, there's always going to be something for the OCD to potentially want to latch onto. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to take hold, but that's going to you know, be very dependent on how early the intervention is, where you kind of, you know, exercise those skills and practice those interventions. Um, but yeah, totally responsive to treatment would follow the, the same lines of everything else that we're saying in these lives. You know, if it's OCD, 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 OCD. So awesome. All right. I like this question. I think a lot of people will um, resonate with the answer to it. So my OCD makes me doubt my senses. Sometimes how can I make a sound decision whether to check or not if I'm not sure whether I heard or saw something dangerous like someone being in trouble. So Florian is talking about it seems like doubting their senses like what they heard or what they saw. And even though that's what they're talking about like their senses in particular what we'll probably say between the two of us is going to apply to any doubt, right? Like, you know, doubt about what you read or what you thought happened, right? So doubt is doubt. Um, so Florian, what, what's really weird, what's really kind of strange about the brain is how malleable and how impressionable it can be. And so they've done research on the the study that comes to mind is they actually took individuals with OCD who struggled with very traditional checking behaviors like checking faucets, checking doors, checking um, hair straighteners and stuff like that. And you would think that as 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 someone continuously goes back and checks, 
that their confidence in their memory would go up, right? That's what intuition would say. That's what common sense would say, that if I checked something 50 times, that would make me more confident in my memory than if I only checked something one time. But they actually determined that the inverse was true. So as someone increased the number of times that they checked something, the less confident they were in their memory. And so I don't really care if that's in this example, they were specifically identifying that that happened with the checking of hair straighteners and faucets and stoves and doors. But what you're doing in this situation is it, it's like you're checking your sensory experiences, right? So I want to go back and I want to check to make sure I didn't see something. I want to go back and check to make sure I didn't hear something. And so your intention in that moment is very surface level, like very superficially understandable. Like I can understand why you have that doubt. And you would feel the need to kind of go back and check that. But just know, according to that research and everything else that we know about ERP and everything that we know about OCD, as soon as you go back and you check that, you are giving into that ritual. And you are, again, according to that research, you're going to make yourself less confident in your memory. Um, and again, I know it sounds totally backwards. OCD is quite backwards at times. So is the treatment for it. Um, but that's kind of tying it all together, right? So what we would ask you to do in ERP is to, you know, engage in that experience. You know, maybe you saw something or, or heard something. You have that spike of anxiety. You have that intrusive thought. What if someone got hurt? What if that happened? And you have that question. And as much as you want to go back and either physically check something or as much as you want to even just review your sensory experience for yourself, Every time you do that, you're basically going and try and checking like those people in the study, you're trying to go and check the faucet or check the hair straightener. And as much as you do that, you do it one time, five times, 10 times, 50 times, you are having a decrease in your confidence in your memory. So every time you do that, you're becoming less and less confident in your memory. And that's how OCD can make you feel like you're going crazy because I'm, I've checked this 50 times. Why am I still not confident? Why am I less confident than I was when I started? That's not because you're going crazy. It's because our brains are completely impressionable and your brain is basically getting the message, huh, Florian must not be sure about their sensory experience because they keep going back and checking. So I guess he must not really be sure about their experience. So it, it's pretty much just the messaging that you're giving your brain by going back and reviewing your sensory experiences or the stove or the faucet or the hair straightener. You're essentially giving your brain evidence and data that you can't be confident in yourself. You must not be confident in yourself because you keep going back and checking. So that's kind of what happens. What do you think? Yeah, I, I also look at certain things that people do, whether it's like, yeah, I, I have to check that front door or I have to check the stove multiple times a day. And would I have to look at that multiple times a day naturally? Uh, and if not, then I already know, okay, I'm doing this multiple times a day. That's probably a compulsion, uh, especially if there's lots of anxiety or there's a huge urge to go check right now in that specific moment. It's one of those big indications that I look for is OCD related. If there's that huge urge and there's lots and lots of anxiety that you've got to know right now in this moment versus kind of just a general like, huh, I wonder if my straightener's on. Hmm, I don't know if I turned it off. But it's not like, oh, I got to figure it out right now in the specific moment. Um, and I think where sometimes what where people get tripped up is like sometimes they they're like finally found that moment where my straightener was on. See, that's why I check. And you know, but that was like one time out of the last ten years of our life where it's actually been true. But we we know that whenever there's a problem, we tend to fix it. But we don't have to count on looking for that problem. And so kind of an indication is we look at, for me, I look at the motivation. Why am I motivated to go check this right now? Is it to relieve anxiety and stress and OCD symptoms? And if that's the case, I'm, I might choose to risk it today and not find out. And what happens is the brain will learn from that experience. It will say, hey, look, nothing happened. And no one broke in, the house didn't start on fire, whatever the worries are. Uh, so maybe I need to stop telling you that you're in danger because you're just not giving into those compulsions anymore. Um, that's how we need to retrain, retrain the brain definitely through this. And I know it's hard to say just risk, risk it. Um, 
but sometimes that's what the exposures are is it's really feeling like a big risk when we find out at the end of it all that it really wasn't mm -hmm. and but we don't know that until we get to the other side yeah um, absolutely and I, know, I can definitely feel like I know that I'm in an exposure situation when it feels like a leap of faith <laughs> like feels like I'm just like surrendering here like I'm I could be doing something right now and I want to be doing something but it feels like a little bit of a risk um yeah it's going to feel irresponsible it's going to feel scary it's going to feel bad potentially that doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong it doesn't mean that you can't handle it or that you need to kind of like backpedal and get out of it 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 means that you still need to just resist the rituals anyway and it's hard but you can do it um and so this leads me, like I said, I go all over the dang place. So I scrolled back up and I feel compelled to ask this question. I could probably do a whole entire live about this, just mental compulsions. Um, any advice on stopping the mental compulsions? There's some other um, stuff there, things like mentally reviewing and analyzing and ends up just leaving me less certain. Uh, yes. Less certain, yes, that would make sense. More uncertain, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what that, yeah, so we're good. So that makes sense, Kristen, right? So as we're saying, right, like you give into these rituals with the mentally reviewing and the analyzing and the moment it feels like you need to do it and it, there's such a pull, such a push to do this, but it ends up making you less certain, which is totally aligned with what Nathan and I just talked about. So something that is big with me now and what I've been telling my members a lot is Sitting with uncertainty and like sitting with that anxiety is something that you, is it, it's not something that you do, it's something that you allow. And so as far as, and I get this question all the time, Nathan, I'm sure you do too, like how do I stop my mental compulsions? How do I stop ruminating? How do I stop this? How do I stop the mental behaviors? And I get it, like it, it does feel trickier, it does feel less, and it is, it's less obvious than like, getting up from the couch, walking to the direction of your bathroom, opening the bathroom door, turning on the faucet, getting the soap and washing your hands for an extended period of time versus like, oh my gosh, I've been ruminating for the past 10 minutes and I didn't even realize it. Um, and I think that's the first step is becoming very aware and kind of very hyper vigilant of when you're giving into these mental compulsions. And you'll know that Kristen and everybody else, when you say things like, I can't walk away. I have to solve this problem right now. Like Nathan mentioned this sense of urgency. Like I have to do it right now. I have to do it right now. That's when you know that you're giving into probably a mental compulsion when you're trying to figure something out or review a conversation in your head. So I would just become very attuned to when you're doing these things like self monitoring, just self monitoring. I think that's the first step of breaking any habit is just self-monitoring, becoming very aware and very acquainted with when you're doing these things so that you can become aware and catch it. Now, as far as catching it, I think that, you know, that, that I have to solve this problem right now is where people get stuck. You feel like you have to, and it feels like there's a big pull. It feels like there's a big risk if you don't solve this problem right now. It feels like there's probably a bit, a lot of justifications for solving these problems. If I solve this problem, I'm gonna feel better. If I solve this problem, then I'll know for sure. If I solve this problem, then X, Y, Z. But when we break down those justifications for the mental rituals, we know that they're that they're BS, that they don't have a leg to stand on. They actually don't make us feel better. We know that these rituals are not equivalent with active, concrete problem solving. And so we have to just, I think first start, starting with just the self-monitoring piece, two, identifying our justifications that we have for these mental compulsions and then busting those justifications. And then three, it's gonna come down to, I think actively and as consistently as you can, making the choice to not solve that problem. So a lot of obsessions are gonna come in the form of a question, right? So what if this could happen? What if I embarrassed myself in conversation? What if I offended someone? What if I looked at that child the wrong way? It's gonna usually come in the form of a question, not always, but sometimes. And your job is to not answer that question. And as difficult as it is, it's going to require you to have like the like 84 times 24, 84 times 24. 
Like it would require effort to calculate that. And so, you know, it's going to require you to have that question in your mind. And like Nathan said, retraining, retraining you to catch that before you start to do the calculations, before you start to try to solve the problem and allowing that uncertainty to be there. It's really truly an allowing process. It's something that you allow versus something that you do. Sometimes people are like, well, how do I sit with anxiety? How do I sit with uncertainty? And it's it's not something that you do. It's something that you just allow to have happen by the nature of you not engaging in these ritualistic behaviors. Um, what do you think? Yeah, I usually, you know, when somebody asks me, how do I stop ruminating or how do I stop doing those mental compulsions or rituals? I usually say your job isn't necessarily to stop them it's to respond differently to them mm -hmm. that's that's the biggest thing is if we focus so much on how can i get these thoughts to go away sometimes that's kind of a compulsion in itself uh, and people get so caught up on how do i get these thoughts to stop how do i get these thoughts to stop uh, that they're looking for those those answers and which is such sounds like such a horrible answer to give is like don't do anything with it but it's more of when the mental rumination starts to happen, how can I respond completely different than I normally would you normally do it? That if I if I'm trying to answer a thought, I'm doing a compulsion. If I'm trying to figure it out, if I'm trying to purposely go back and look for evidence, whatever it could be, I'm doing a compulsion. But if I'm choosing to keep it uncertain, not try to figure it out, sometimes even agree with whatever threat is there, which I know can sometimes be scary, but it's taking the power away from the thoughts and almost just saying, I like what Jenna said, like accept that they're there, accept that you actually have, have all the power in the world. And when the thoughts happen, then they happen. And for me, it's like, how can I even respond? I have tons of thoughts right now. And it might be like, I love, I love all these thoughts. These are so great. I'm so glad that I'm watching this movie and it just came right into my brain. And you're welcome to stay the whole movie if you want. You can also go if you want, like that would be great. And I'm so, I love thinking about these things. It's so wonderful. Like it's just such a complete different response than maybe people are used to. And it feels like a complete lie too, but it doesn't matter because the brain needs to know that you don't care about those thoughts. It doesn't, you, you're not going to give them any value whatsoever. And it's such a hard concept and a skill to learn to say, oh, caught myself ruminating. Uh, I need to respond completely different to these. Um, mm -hmm. I like also just reiterate what Jenna said is keep track of different times where like, man, it's every time I'm driving in the car or, or it's at nighttime when I'm about ready to get to bed or Those are two whatever big it is. Yeah, two big ones. This is why I mentioned them because they're pretty common that we know, okay, I'm jumping in that car. Thoughts might happen. They might not, but I'm going to almost allow it to happen if it does mm -hmm. and just respond completely different to it. Because when people are like, oh no, I'm driving, it's going to happen. What am I supposed to do? Then it's like inviting that in and then not knowing what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, just let it be and practice almost kind of being a bully to it in a way. Yeah. Hmm. This this reminds me of something that I often tell my members, which is like this feels very tiptoey to me, which I can understand why, like why we would want to tiptoe around these things. They're scary when we don't have all the education and all the context for it. Um, but tiptoeing, like I'm tiptoeing around the mental stuff. I'm tiptoeing around these obsessions. Like where is it? I, I feel like so many people with OCD live basically like they're in a haunted house and they're just tiptoeing like when's the next thing gonna pop up like I'm just worried for the next trigger I'm just kind of tiptoeing and it, just a lot of tiptoeing um and what you're talking about Nathan is like being on the offense like going into the car like I'm going to try to have these thoughts I am going to invite them in I'm going to I you know just welcome them and I hope I think about these things and stay with me for the movie that's totally fine like there are two totally discrepant attitudes. Like if you have that attitude going into a, a haunted house, like I'm the type of person in a haunted house, I'm tiptoeing, I'm tiptoeing and I'm like holding my ears and I'm like closing my eyes. But we've all been in a haunted house too, where we see those, they're usually like big burly men 
who have like eight girls behind them and like they get maybe scared a little bit, but then they like very quickly keep going and they're big and confident and they're like on the offense. They're like, bring it, bring it. That's kind of what you need to do. Like it's hard. They're kind of discrepant attitudes, right? Like you can't be on the offense. Like you're saying, inviting it in before you have the movie, before you get into the car, inviting them in. It's hard, hard to do that and be tiptoeing at the same time. Like by doing what it is that Nathan is saying, you basically eliminate the tiptoey aspect. So basically be the big burly man in the haunted house. Don't be like me. <laughs> Don't be like me. All right. Um, we'll do a COVID question. How can I not engage in cleaning the hotel room, especially now during COVID? How do you draw the line between common sense and OCD? So first things first, what I've always said during this crazy pandemic, which like being an OCD therapist during COVID has been wild, totally wild. Um, I We would always have encouraged people to stick to the CDC guidelines and not an inch above that. So. I don't know what the CDC guidelines say about cleaning hotel rooms. I don't know. I also, if I, I have to stay in a hotel room next week and it never would have occurred to me to check the CDC guidelines before I do that. Um, so I would stick very closely just to the CDC guidelines as much as possible. I work with still so many people who are washing their mail, who are washing their groceries. The CDC is not saying to do that. I don't think. Um, so, so yeah, the CDC is saying if you're vaccinated and you're around vaccinated people, you don't have to socially distance. You don't have to wear a mask. So making sure that you are at least doing the CDC guidelines. And then you're bringing up another point that people often ask about, which is like, okay, well, normal people do this, whatever normal even means, right? Um, and it's, you know, other people would say, well, it's normal to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom. It's normal to do this. It's normal to do that. And and people with OCD will try in a, in a sense of desperation to figure out, like, to get that justification. Like, okay, cool. I'm. It's okay for me to do that. It's cool. I can still keep that. I would, if you're really, truly invested, and, and like we had talked about previously, we talked about the, this concept of willingness, right? Like, are you willing to do what it takes to get better? Are you willing to do what it takes to recover? And not always, but sometimes you may have to be willing to do things that would, quote unquote, like the, what is not normal, right? And we don't know what's normal anyway. Like, yes, I'm sure if you were to pull 100 people, if they say, and they would all say that they wash their hands after they go to the bathroom, but research has shown that that's actually not true. A lot more people than would say don't wash their hands after they go to the bathroom, so on and so forth. So we're never going to know what's normal. And you can spin your wheels on that forever and exhaust yourself about what's normal and what's common sense and what's not. But what I would make your lighthouse, you know, what I would make your compass if treatment is truly a priority to you and, and recovery is a priority to you, I would ask yourself, what's good for my treatment instead of what's normal? What's normal? What do other people do? Because you'll always get another answer. It will never be enough. You'll always have that doubt. Like, yeah, I asked that person what they do, but what about this person? Like, it's just never going to be enough. And so I would ask yourself instead and make your guiding light instead be what's good for my treatment? What's helpful for me right now? And knowing that, knowing everything that I've said, there are still probably going to be some things that you struggle to do. There are still, it's probably, I'm assuming it would be way too difficult for you to just not clean the hotel room. But maybe you can find baby steps, right? So maybe you, uh, I don't know, it would be different for everybody, but maybe you only change one of the pillowcases instead of all of them. Maybe you, um, I don't know, like lay on the on the old sheets before you change into the new sheets. I'm just giving ideas, right? So maybe you maybe you clean off the entire bathroom sink, but you don't clean the counter. You don't clean the countertops. You just clean the sink and the faucets, right? So just asking yourself, like, this is what I want to do to make my OCD 100% satisfied. 
how do I make it 99% satisfied? Mm -hmm. Or even like 50% satisfied or 25% satisfied, right? Like find rituals that you can resist. Find, if you can't resist completely, trying to find that wiggle room, like what can I reduce doing? What can I postpone doing? Little things like that. Mm -hmm. I say CDC guidelines as well. Anything past that, uh, we're, we're willing to risk essentially. And unless we see, unless we actually see a problem. So when somebody walks in the room, they grab your remote and they say, well, I have COVID and they grab your remote and put it back down. Then it's like, okay, like we have a problem to solve without that, without that really, really good evidence, which we don't really look for. It just kind of finds us. Uh, there's nothing to solve past that point. And for me, I always say, you know, people tend to have an idea of like, oh, I'm so worried about using that pillow when I go in. Or I'm so worried about using that washcloth or whatever it is. Instead of anticipating having to do that, sometimes it literally is walking right into that hotel room and like, I better use that pillow like immediately. I better go touch that washcloth as fast as I can or that washcloth is going to be around my neck the, you know, while I'm in that hotel room, just because I need to tell my brain that this doesn't have as, have as much value as I, it's telling me it does. Um, because when people are anticipating trying to problem solve already before they've even gotten in there, and they're kind of going down the wrong path. And so we say, let's make it more active. How can I go in and kind of mess up all the rules my brain already wants to create? Mm -hmm. And so and even if it looks weird, just run in, put your hand on the pillow, grab, go grab this, go touch the door handle. like. We kind of just do it. Just like belly, just like full on belly flop <laughs> onto the bed. Yeah. I know make it sound easy. I know how hard that can be. But just before your brain can even convince you not to, sometimes it's like run in there, go do it. It's pretty much saying if it tells you not to, it's probably the thing to do. Because mm -hmm. you're going to know. Like I'm not going to grab this thing that someone just told me they had COVID. Uh, like We don't have to question that. We just kind of know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're only, at least to begin with, like your responsibility is to the behaviors. Your responsibility, I think people sometimes get caught up in like, well, it's gonna feel so bad and it's, I'm gonna think these thoughts and it's gonna feel like this and da, da, da. like your responsibility is to the behaviors, right? First and foremost, like you're saying. And I, I think there are two different ways to handle it. Like I, I went right for the defense, which is like reducing these rituals and resisting these, but Nathan, like offense is an option too. Like just going for it going for it um, and knowing what's on the other side. Like I'm a big fan of, and I will always be a big proponent of reminding yourself of why you're intentionally making yourself feel like crap. Like truly reminding yourself of why, like why this is so important. Why is it so important for you to go and like wrap yourself up in this nasty blanket? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's important for you. It's not just about the blanket, right? Like it's not just about the hotel sheets. It's about you being able to have freedom and being able to do the things that you want to do and being able to overcome uncertainty, being willing to put yourself in these anxiety provoking situations, saying that I declare independence from this and I'm not going to allow OCD to make these decisions for me. OCD is not making this decision for me right now. It's just not. And just seeing what happens. But definitely hard and so much easier said than done but you'll have to come back and let us know how it went <laughs> i'm curious like what exposures came up that would be really fun to see um all right there was a really good question nathan i'm curious uh, your thoughts about this one this might have to be our last question um bacon lee swiss i like that name it's a cool picture <laughs> I've heard of OCD rage and I think I get it often. How do I cope and not blow up? So a couple other people had mentioned really struggling. Like when I get anxious, I, it, I just like freak out and I blow up and I get angry when I can't give into my rituals, I get angry. So what do you think about this? Mm. I would say, man, super common. We know that anger is, is a secondary emotion. And so there's always that thing that happens first. And, OCD often is, is a big, big piece with that. So what I look for is, you know, when the anger or rage does happen, is that automatic or is that something that is almost kind of a choice 
for the person that I, because I had to touch this thing I didn't want to touch, I'm choosing to be angry about it. Um, that's one thing I'm like, oh man, we have a lot of control over that. We're actually going to choose to respond completely different if you feel like you have that control. When that rage happens, you know, automatically, we often say try to either channel that, for me, channel that back into an exposure if that's something you're doing, uh, or it's, it's allowing that to sometimes just be like, it's okay to get angry, uh, but it's the way that we're responding to that or how we're behaving that we try to control. Um, I know that as we start reducing anxiety and OCD symptoms, for me personally, I've seen that go down, that rage that people have just because one follows the other. They're not feeling either as hopeless, they're not feeling as angry because they can touch the things they used to or they're doing the things they haven't been doing before. Um, so when it does happen, it's hard to just be like, well, don't be angry then, like figure it out. But often it's actually like, I allow yourself to be angry, sometimes allow the rage to happen, but choose, just like we would do an exposure, choose how you're going to do do something different with that. That I might sit here with this rage and be super angry and have my fists like this instead of throwing things across the room if that's what it's going to be, or instead of saying things that I didn't really mean to other people. Uh, I would use that as like, man, this is a really big trigger for me, this thing that just caused this, and I would write it down. Like mm -hmm. touching this cup, it was a really big trigger. This sentence I just read was a really big trigger. And we say, let's use that for exposures. So we can even practice rage, how you're gonna respond differently to that. Just like it were you know, guilt or shame or all these other emotions that people feel when they're having anxiety, we need to respond completely different because it wants you to get angry. It, essentially, or the brain wants you to respond because it thinks that that's something that you need in that moment. And instead we sometimes have to just say, let it be. But let me like feel that feeling just be like, oh, I love this rage. I've had people do that before. Like I love this anger feeling that I get right now. And I just like every time it happens, it's so wonderful, um, which is so hard to do because the brain kind of shuts off during those rage moments. And but it's something to practice. For me, I say like, let's do this exposure. Like let's face the thing that caused the rage. And we're going to be really aware that, that feeling is going to come. And this is how you're going to respond. You're going to just say, man, I love it. This is great. I'm going to sit here with this feeling, almost like it were a panic attack and just like let it, let it reduce all by itself without trying to control it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just another signal, sometimes a false signal that's just being sent that your brain thinks you need. Um, but we allow it essentially. That's kind of my take for yeah. it. There <laughs> is a little baby bunny right outside. And it's just like, as we're talking about rage, there's this cute little baby bunny <laughs> like right outside. Um, but no, I, I totally agree as far as it being like a secondary emotion. And I know I'm that way too. Like my anxiety comes out as irritability. Um, especially during postpartum when I was struggling, like that went out all the way, like all, all rage towards my husband. Um, but, it, but like Nathan said, like you really have to ask yourself the why, like what's going on. Um, when I would rage on my husband, we called it rage texting. Um, I just felt like really urgently, like I really needed him to come home. And in hindsight, like I, I, I knew, I, sh I wish I would have been able to practice in the moment, like this is actually a really good exposure for me. It feels really awful right now and it will pass you know, this anger will come and it will go and it will pass if I allow it and I don't avoid it or escape it. Um, and something else that I love that we used to teach at Rogers is um, opposite action. It's from dialectical behavioral therapy for more like mm -hmm. emotion regulation difficulties, but it's not too far discrepant from ERP, which is why I love it. So opposite action would come into place like if what you want to do is throw something, what's the opposite of throwing something? Uh, maybe like hugging something instead, maybe like hugging a teddy bear, like doing the opposite, right? And basically, again, teaching your brain that you're in control, teaching your brain that you're in control of your behavioral manifestations of how that um, emotion comes out and just allowing yourself to feel whatever it is that you feel. And again, asking yourself too, 
you know, is this helpful? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. is this helpful? Is this behavior consistent with my values? Is this consistent with how I want to be showing up for my values during my recovery? And I think with rage too, I think with anger, I think of it being like a forest fire. That's like, once it's too big, it's just really difficult to put out. So like once we're raging versus just a little bit irritated, it's hard to implement the skills that we're talking about because it's just so out of control and like we're offline, we're offline and these skills don't make sense. And we're not, we're not, um, you know, really able to apply logic as much. Um, but that's when I think there are probably some smaller fires, right? Like every forest fire started with a small little spark that could have been contained mm -hmm. if we could have caught it soon enough. And so I think of aggression, I think of, rage that way. Like when I think of aggression and rage, it's like a for like a forest fire comes to mind. It's gonna be really difficult to put out and implement these skills. But I wonder if in hindsight, those rage moments, those aggressive moments could have been little little smaller fires that had a spark somewhere. And I think it's about in the future recognizing those small sparks, like Nathan is saying, what's going on here? Is there a better way to be handling this? What's helpful for me? And am I, what I want to do, like, is there an opposite action type of approach I can take? Can I apply ERP to this? Can I allow this emotion to pass by just letting me feel it without having to avoid it or escape it? Um, and yeah, I would definitely resist, resist any, anything like isolation, resisting anything that's going to kind of contribute to just feeling, feeling negative like that. So, so yeah, I know a lot of people here were struggling with that tonight. So hopefully yeah. that was helpful. Mm -hmm. um, anything else, Nathan? I want them, why don't you remind them one more time where to find more about you, where to find more about your course and all that good stuff. Yeah, uh, you can find me, I mean, I'm on Instagram as well, OCD and Anxiety Online. Uh, my website, ocdandanxietyonline.com is where my course is located. Uh, my BFRB, somebody asked earlier, like, what does that mean? Is that what they were saying? It's a body focused repetitive behavior. So that's uh, skin picking, hair pulling. And that is on bfrbonline.com. And uh, th that's brand new. I just released it like two days ago, three days ago. And so definitely can find me on YouTube as well. Uh, my channel name OCD and anxiety. I think you keep it all one word. You can find me there. And I try to post videos and do lives just like this. I've had Jenna on there uh, a couple times, and it's it's awesome. It's wonderful. Everyone's such a great support on there, and uh, yeah, I, I love it. I try to give things that are very like uh, since I can't give therapy advice online, it's more like here's some skills that like generally might help everybody, and that's kind of my goal is uh, see what you can use from information that that we give. Yeah. Um, I love ERP for that reason. It's like, here are your skills. We want you to learn the skills and use them forever. So Nathan, thank you so much for joining us. It went by really fast, at least for mm -hmm. me. Thank you for um, taking over while I had a little change in, in studio settings, mm -hmm. back to the basement. Um, yeah, so these will be recorded. These will be saved. If you guys wanna um, catch up later, they'll be on our YouTube and we have an error for Facebook. I'll get that figured out, but maybe it'll be on Facebook as well. Um, but definitely go and check out Nathan. Um, yes, it will be up later. It will be up. It's going to be recorded on at least on our YouTube. So make sure you go to our YouTube, um, share it, come back for more webinars. Um, I'll be back tomorrow with Tia Wilson. Um, she's an OCD advocate. So I'll be back mm -hmm. tomorrow night with Tia. Um, and Nathan, thank you again so much. You're one of my awesome. favorites. Thank you, you so much. I Appreciate awesome. you being like allowing me to be on this. So thank yeah, you so absolutely. much. Absolutely. And thank you. you I know we like both had that parent guilt, like felt bad saying <laughs> goodnight to our kiddos. So I really appreciate you taking the time yeah. to do this with us. Thank you so absolutely. much. Absolutely. Bye guys. You. We wish you the best thank of luck in recovery. See you tomorrow. Yep. Bye. -bye. Bye.